When we look up at the night sky, it can sometimes be easy to get the impression that the stars that we see are constant or unchanging. Or perhaps if the stars are evolving, they're evolving over such long time scales, over millions and millions of years, that it's just occurring too slowly for us to see variations in individual stars. And this actually isn't always the case. In fact, in the late 1700s, astronomers had started to discover a new class of stars that are known as variable stars. Variable stars. And these variable stars will actually change between being bright and dim and keep on repeating that uh, getting brighter and getting dimmer uh, process over and over. Sometimes over the course of months they'll get brighter and dimmer. Sometimes this will happen over the course of hours. So there's a whole lot of uh, differences, different types of these variable stars. And one subtype of variable star that we're very interested in and is very uh, helpful in measuring cosmic distances is the set of Cepheid variable stars. So Cepheid variables. And these stars, uh, they're the period that it takes, the amount of time it takes to go through one full cycle of getting brighter and then getting dimmer again, for these Cepheid variables usually takes about 1 to 50 days. So, for example, uh, here's a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of M31, which is the Andromeda Galaxy, the nearest large spiral galaxy to us. And in the Andromeda Galaxy, we can see this one star. And these pictures, these uh, inset pictures, are taken between December 17th, 2010 and January 26th, 2011. And we see that this star starts out moderately bright, gets a little bit dimmer, and then suddenly brightens up again. And, and uh, it will actually go through this cycle. If we saw uh, more pictures of this afterwards and before, we would see that it goes through this regular cycle of getting dimmer and then getting brighter and repeating. And we actually can use this as a way of measuring cosmic distances. Now, although this class of stars was first discovered in the late 1700s, it really wasn't until the early 1900s when astronomer Henrietta Leavitt, Henrietta Leavitt, uh, who's pictured here, really made the first groundbreaking discoveries about Cepheid variables that allowed us to actually use them as a cosmic distance indicator. Now, at the time, Henrietta Leavitt and a number of other women were working at uh, Harvard for astronomer Edward Pickering. And it's unfortunate to say, but at the time, women weren't actually allowed to use telescopes. So what they would be given is all of the photographic plates that had all of the pictures and images from the telescope. And their job was basically working as human computers. They would stare at all of these uh, thousands upon thousands of uh, pictures of stars and try to identify which stars had changes to their brightness in order to identify these Cepheid variable stars. So an incredibly tedious uh, task. And Henry Le Henrietta Leavitt was specifically looking at stars in the large and small Magellanic clouds. And now those are two dwarf galaxies that orbit the uh, that orbit the Milky Way galaxy. And she was looking at this set of stars. So if you were looking at an individual, uh, at an individual Cepheid variable, then let's say this is the luminosity and this is time. Then as you looked at these images of the stars, you would notice that their, uh, their brightness would go up and then gradually decrease and rapidly go up and gradually decrease and keep having this repeating getting brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer. But what Henrietta Leavitt noticed is that if you looked at the period, how long it took between periods of maximum brightness, if you looked at that period, that was related to how bright the object looked. So if I had a, a different object that had a much longer period, so 
this one, this top picture, more time elapses between uh, periods of peak luminosity. She noticed that the longer period Cepheid variables are brighter. Uh, since all of these objects were in the uh, uh, large and small Magellanic clouds, she could say that they're all at about the same distance away. So any difference in brightness wasn't due to the, uh, the distance that they were away, it had to be due to their intrinsic luminosity. So she noticed that this period, uh, the period of the Cepheid variable is related to the luminosity. Now at the time, the absolute distance to the large and small Magellanic clouds wasn't known. So she couldn't actually get an exact measurement of the luminosity. She could only say that period, long period Cepheid variables have to be a certain factor brighter than short period Cepheid variables. However, less than one year after publishing her results, and I think I'll post a link to, uh, to the where you can actually read her papers, uh, less than one year after she published those results, astronomer Anyar Hertzsprung, the same guy from the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, noted that in some of the clusters of stars that he could use spectroscopic parallax to measure their distances to, some of these star clusters actually contained Cepheid variable stars. So he was able to measure the distances to those Cepheid variables and actually calibrate this diagram. And when we do this, we can make a graph that looks something like this. Now this is mock data, but it gets the point across. And on this figure, each one of these dots would represent an individual Cepheid variable that we've accurately measured the distance to, and thereby we can measure its luminosity. So we have the average luminosity of the Cepheid variable compared to the sun on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have the period of the Cepheid variable. How long is it between crests in the brightness of this star. And we've put this on a log-log plot. And very clearly we notice a clear relationship between period and luminosity. The shorter the period, the dimmer the star is going to be, and the long period stars are going to be very bright. So if I look at some distant star and I can measure its brightness over time and get a good sense of what the period of that Cepheid variable is, I can get a very good estimate of how bright it has to be. And if I know how bright it is, I can use it as a standard candle to measure the distance to that star. Now, with this figure, one of the other things that we notice is that these Cepheid variables are all very bright. Even the dimmest ones are a thousand times brighter than the sun. And some of the longer period Cepheid variables can be tens of thousands of times brighter than the sun. And the brighter our standard candle, the further we can measure our cosmic distances. So using this Cepheid variable method, we can measure cosmic distances a few tens of millions of light years away. So it's very good at measuring the distances to nearby galaxies. So let's look at a specific example, and we're gonna go back to this example of the star V1 in the Andromeda galaxy. And I'll post the paper where I get some of the numbers for this example. Now, if you very carefully look at the brightness of this star over time, you'll notice that it has a period of approximately 31.4 days. So we know the period of this Cepheid variable, and we can go back to our graph for the luminosity period diagram, and uh, we have to be careful that this is a log-log graph. And 31.4 corresponds to about this point here. And if we go over, then this will correspond to a luminosity of approximately 16,000 times the luminosity of the sun. So we can now say that this star has to have a luminosity, an average luminosity, of about 16,000 times L sun. And let's give us a little bit more room. And the luminosity of the sun is actually about 3.85 times 10 to the 26 watts. So if we multiply this out, the luminosity of this object in watts is about 6.2 times 10 to the 30 watts. So that's how bright this one star is. We can also, when we're looking at this object through a telescope, 
measure the flux from this object, how much light is hitting each square meter of our telescope. And very roughly, this is about 1 times 10 to the negative 15 watts per meter squared. And once we have these two numbers, we have everything that we need to measure the distance to this object. So we have our flux luminosity relation that we've seen a, a number of times before. And I can rearrange this equation to solve for the distance r. And when I do that, just uh, with a bit of algebra, I get r equals the square root of L over 4 pi times the flux. And plugging these numbers in, I get a measurement of the distance to this star of about 2.2 times 10 to the 22 meters. Or in astronomy units, this is approximately equal to 2.35 million light years. So this is fairly close to the currently accepted distance to the Andromeda galaxy, which is about 2.54 plus or minus 0.06 million light years. So this distance measurement actually does work quite well. And this particular measurement of uh, the distance to V1 in the Andromeda galaxy was originally made by Hubble in the 1920s. And this is arguably one of the most important stars in the history of astronomy because this distance measurement of 2.5 million light years proved that this was actually a distant galaxy. Before then, it was believed that the Milky Way was the only galaxy, and this uh, mass of swirling stars and gas was thought to be just some smaller object within the Milky Way. But Hubble's distance measurement using these Cepheid variables proved that the Milky Way is just one of many, many galaxies, so it really changed our understanding of astronomy. So this is how we use these Cepheid variables to measure the distances to nearby galaxies. And again, these stars are bright enough that we can see them up to a few tens of millions of light years away. But if we want to measure the distances to galaxies that are farther away than that, we're going to need a new kind of standard candle that's even brighter than these Cepheid variables. And we'll talk about that in the next video.